Evening, everyone. Now, as um, Emily said, this is the final series, the final part of the series, uh, Jesus Eats. And we have done this series to kind of lead us up to Easter by looking through the Gospels. We do this every single year as we get towards Easter. We want to just concentrate on looking at Jesus and his interactions with people. And so much of what you find in the Gospels is Jesus speaking, not in religious places, not in the temple so much, but at the meal table. It's in dinners. It's in eating and drinking with people. He got a reputation of being a drunkard and a glutton, a friend of sinners, because he was always out, demonstrably out, eating with people. That's where we do life. That's where we do relationship. When I first met Kate, yeah, which is now 31 years ago. I was five years old at the time. But when I first met Kate, the first thing that we did in order to embark on this lifelong relationship was what? Hoping. Yes, that's a very um, Jane Austen way of putting it. Uh, I took her out for a meal. We went to Pizza Express, not Pizza Hut, Pizza Express, you know, really classy. And uh, it was over the meal table that we began to share and open up because it's a safe space. It's, it's a space where you build relationship, where you go deeper with another person. And that is how Jesus is with people. Now, as I said, we do this running up to Easter, but because we've got the Metro weekend next weekend. Yes. And if you haven't got your tickets, if you haven't booked your place, do know that actually, if you can't make the whole thing, you can come for one day. You can take an evening ticket, a night overnight ticket or just a day ticket on the Saturday. But um, you need to get on the weekend. But because we've got the weekend, we're actually missing our normal service here. And that would be Palm Sunday. And then the following Sunday is uh, Easter. And I wanted to get something in about the resurrection. So we were kind of messing up with the order. But I thought it was so interesting. I really, really wanted to do something about Jesus eating post-resurrection. Because you'd think, and particularly if you're not sure about faith, if you're new to faith, you'd think that when Jesus is risen from the dead, that's an end to the eating and the drinking. Because the eating and drinking is just so kind of physical and normal and ordinary. You'd think that Jesus would be elevated beyond those things. When we think about the life to come, we think often about being these kind of disembodied entities floating on clouds in ethereal glory with harps. And you don't eat, you don't drink, you just sing hymns for millions of years. But actually Jesus resurrected saying, this is what it looks like. He eats more than ever. In fact, we get to see the things that he eats, not just the people that he eats with. We get this kind of Instagram photo of Jesus's meals. Here's broiled fish. Here's uh, bread on the beach. And it is incredible because there's something about the age to come and the life that we have to look forward to, which includes all the best stuff about drinking together and eating together and doing life and doing relationship over a meal table. And so we're going to look at this passage. It's Luke 24, and it is the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And honestly, in looking at this, I think it is the greatest piece of writing ever about Jesus. It's the greatest piece of writing that anybody has ever done. And we don't give it enough credit because it's kind of stuffed at the end of the gospel, almost like an epilogue style piece. But actually, when you get into this passage and you look at it, you see that there's so much of the message of good news, of the love of God, the gospel that's contained. There's so much of how Jesus transforms people. There's so much of how we find hope in despair. It is really, really extraordinary. So we're going to read this and we're going to do things a little bit differently this week, because instead of kind of going a bit at a time like we would normally do, I'm just going to read the whole passage. You know, it's, it's a long passage, so bear with me. But we're just going to read the whole thing. And what I'm wanting to ask you to do is as we read this, I want you to do two things. First, I want you to pray, prepare your heart and open yourself up to the Holy Spirit to make it come alive to you. And secondly, what I want you to do is I want you to try and picture the scene. And picture yourself within the scene. So we're going to talk about these two disciples. And I want you to imagine that you are one of those disciples. And this stuff is happening to you. How do you feel? How are you experiencing? 
And so we're going to read the Bible passage. Then I've got a couple of things that I'd like to say about it. And then I want to give us just uh, an ending with a few kind of practical ways in which we can take this and build it, incorporate it into our everyday ongoing Christian relationship with Jesus. So right now, just close your eyes. In fact, you might even want to keep your eyes closed for the whole thing, but close your eyes right now and let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you come and illuminate this passage to us? Let us see wonderful things of you in this as we read in Jesus name. Okay, here it comes. Now that same day, which is Easter Sunday, two of them, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? He asked about Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explains to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us? While he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. That's the passage. It kind of carries on because they immediately <laughs> run all the seven miles back to Jerusalem, speak to the rest of the disciples, and then Jesus is there. And this just is just the most amazing thing. But I want us to look a little bit at just some of the elements in this, because it's kind of one of those stories that the more that you unpeel the layers, the more that you see resonances for all of Scripture, the, the more that it begins to chime with our own life. And I'm just going to take three phrases. You saw them kind of highlighted in bold and in yellow. And the first phrase is this. They say, but we had hoped. But we had hoped. And it speaks to us in times where we feel let down, where we feel broken hearted, where we feel disillusioned. These are guys that are not just walking on a journey towards a, vi a village called Emmaus. They're actually walking on a journey of disappointment. I don't know how many of you right now can identify with being on a journey of disappointment. For some of us, we've had hopes about how things in our lives are going to work out. Maybe you had a relationship that you thought, this is the one. This is the one that's going to really make me happy. It's going to go the distance. And you find that it lets you down. It doesn't happen. And you think, but I, I had hoped. Or maybe you hoped that someone would come along by now or that things would be different in your life. And you get to a point where you think, is it ever going to happen for me? Is it ever going to work out? But we had hoped. Or maybe that you're in uh, your career or the work that you're doing at university and you had all these hopes about what it was going to look like and how it was going to pan out. And you find yourself thinking, ah, oh, it's not worked out the way that I wanted. It's, it's not happening the way that I thought it would. But we had hoped. 
Or it may just be the kind of the low level general stuff about living in a society today where we have this kind of Instagram picture perfect vision of what our lives should look like. Everyone should be super fulfilled, living your best life all the time. And then you come to the reality of it and it's generation rent. It is economic shock. It is war in Ukraine, war in Gaza. It is a a kind of lifestyle which is not as good as a generation before. And you just think, we were promised all this stuff. We were promised that we would have all these wonderful things that would bring us into a modern utopia and life would be great. But it's not worked out that way. Instead, we have debt and we have anxiety and we have depression and we have all these challenges that we face that we had hoped. What the amazing thing is that Jesus walks along with these disciples. Now, a little word about the disciples. We get one of them named, and that is Cleopas. Everyone say Cleopas. Cleopas. Now, Cleopas is really interesting because Cleopas is identified as a disciple. Now, he's clearly not one of the 12 disciples, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all those guys. Actually, yeah, not those guys. But uh, (laughs) Luke, anyway, never mind. Uh, Cleopas is just, he's one of these people who was following Jesus. But he's not one of the main 12 disciples. But what is unusual is that his name comes twice in scripture, this time in Luke, and then also in John. And he comes in John kind of uh, obliquely because the message that John gives is that he records the people, the women that stood at the the foot of the cross of Jesus and who watched him as he was being crucified. And John said there was four women. There was Mary, his mother. There was Mary's sister, his aunt. There was Mary Magdalene. And then there was another Mary who was the wife of Cleopas or Clopas. We're pretty sure it's the same person. And so it became an early tradition right from the very earliest church fathers to say, actually, we don't know for certain, but on balance of probability, it's most likely that the two disciples were husband and wife, Mary and Cleopas. Mary had actually been at the foot of the cross. She'd seen Jesus die. She'd seen the crown of thorns jammed into his temple. She'd seen the blood running down the wood. She'd seen a spear go into his side. She watched him die. But we had hoped. And the weird thing is that Jesus, for whatever reason, he comes alongside them But unlike with others, when he goes to the disciples at large, he doesn't say, hey, guys, it's me. I've risen from the dead. He just keeps himself hidden. And I wonder why is it that Jesus doesn't show himself? Why does he just kind of keep them in the dark? He has his resurrection body, which is so much like our body. You can eat, you can drink, you can walk, you can talk. And yet it's unlike anything that we can imagine. You can somehow look different to people or you can disguise your appearance or he can suddenly be in another place instantaneously. He can can walk through walls because he's more solid than the solid world in which we live. There's all these various things. So why does Jesus hide himself? I think it's because Jesus sometimes wants to walk with us in our discouragement. If you're feeling like you're in a situation of challenge, someone that you love is in dire straits and you're praying, 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 but nothing seems to happen. It's not that God says, don't worry, have faith, here I am. Sometimes God just walks with us in ways that we don't even recognize that he's with us. He walks alongside us and we don't know that he's there. But in the midst of our discouragement, in the midst of our disappointment, in the midst of our confusion, He's there with us. And the amazing thing about these two disciples is that it's not like they haven't heard about Jesus rising from the dead. It's literally Easter Sunday. And they say to the stranger that they don't realize is Jesus. They said, the women saw angels and the angels said that he is risen. And then everything that the angels said, our guys, our, the men, they went to the tomb. They found it just as the angels had said. It was empty supernatural, unbelievable. And yet with all this evidence, they don't believe it. They just think that's a weird thing. I don't understand that. But no one's saying, oh, he's clearly risen from the dead because it's not what they were expecting. 
You know, on Easter Sunday morning, no one was there by the tomb, by the stone, with their hands on their wristwatches going, 10, 9, 8, 7. No one's expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. They're all just completely perplexed. What they don't know, and maybe what you don't know in the situation that you're in right now, is that that thing that you've asked God for, that you feel disappointed that he's not come through, that prayer that you've offered and you just feel like, oh, God has not, he's not answered this. He, he's nowhere near me. I'm in the dark. You just need to know, like Mary and Cleopas, he may have already answered your prayer. We hoped he would redeem Israel. Actually, he has redeemed not just Israel, but the whole world. He's done that for them, in front of them, before them. It's incredible. He has done everything, way more than they could have ever asked or imagined, but they don't realize it. And there's something so powerful about Jesus saying, listen, I'm not going to minimize your suffering and I'm not going to dismiss it. I'm actually going to walk alongside you. And there are some times in our lives where we go through things as believers where we can't find God, but you just need to know the example of Mary and Cleopas, he's with you in ways that you don't see, in ways that you can't recognize, in ways that you don't perceive. And he is gently coming alongside you. He's already answered more than you realize. But within the moment of disillusionment, within the moment of pain, within the moment of confusion, he is there. Why doesn't God heal me? Why doesn't God sort out my head? Why doesn't God come through for me? Why do I go through this stuff again? Why am I living in these kinds of circumstances? And Jesus himself walks alongside us. But then here's the next phrase. It says this, then their eyes were opened. Everyone say their eyes were opened. This is where it gets really good. Because what you get in Mary and Cleopas is you basically get a kind of template for the Christian experience. These are people that have their hopes dashed, who have looked for a kind of a worldly solution to their problems. They are looking for a Messiah who will do things in a standard human way. Military overthrow of the oppressor. And it's been dashed. Their human hopes have been dashed. They've come to the end of themselves. They're disillusioned. They're disappointed. But they meet someone. That person begins to speak to them. And, and he speaks to them. They see stuff in Scripture. And suddenly they realize there's a, an answer in Scripture that is greater than anything that I'd ever imagined possible. And then there's this moment of revelation. Their eyes were opened. And they see Jesus as he is, as he breaks the bread. Is this amazing moment? Of course, Jesus breaking bread, it's like that communion moment. Some people like to imagine that as Jesus breaks the bread, they see his hands pierced for them and suddenly they realize. But there's this moment of incredible open eyes, revelation. I see Jesus. I didn't realize that it was him, but now I know that he is the son of God. And what Luke is doing, which makes it so, so fantastic and so, so powerful, is he's saying, look, there's this meal that these people have, this husband and wife. They share a meal and Jesus is there. But what it does is it reflects all the way back to the very beginning of Scripture. The only other time in the Bible that that specific phrase, their eyes were opened, is used. And it's all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. The fall, where a husband and wife, Adam and Eve, are having a kind of impromptu meal, the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as they eat that fruit, the Bible says, then their eyes were opened. But what are their eyes open to? Their eyes are opened to guilt and to shame. They feel naked and they feel ashamed. And they see death coming into human experience. And now, on this road to Emmaus, where they finally stopped and they're in and they're eating. It's another husband and wife. It's another meal. But the very same phrase, then their eyes are opened. But it's not to shame and it's not to sin. It's not to how awful you are, but it's to forgiveness. It's the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead. And instead of death coming into the world, death is now defeated. 
And the resurrection changes absolutely everything. And what Jesus wants to do is to continually open our eyes so we see him more and more and more clearly. And then here's the final phrase. They say, we're not our hearts burning within us. Our hearts were burning within us. This is the powerful thing. They say, were not our hearts burning within us when he opened up the scriptures? Everyone say, open up the scriptures. The thing about the Bible, and this is what I kind of want to get into, is that the Bible is not just something that has to be read. It's something that has to be opened up. Now, I don't know where you're at with scripture. I don't know where you are with that kind of devotional practice of reading the Bible. Some of you mega good at doing this. You know, my wife, she is incredible. Even this afternoon, she was into it again. She reads through the Bible in a year. She goes through all the kind of the stuff and all the explanations and then more explanations on top of the explanations. She spends hours just reading the Bible and, and all of that stuff. And for some people, they just have this kind of hunger for it. She actually qualified. She graduated last Saturday, got her master's degree in theology. I think that's worth a round of applause. She wore a funny hat. It was hilarious. But uh, she's just naturally into it. But for some of us, it's like it's a real challenge. It's a real chore. Some of you, you just find that you don't have the attention span for it or your mind wanders or it's just so hard to, to get into the habit. And you kind of know that it's one of those things that Christians should do, but you really struggle with it. Wherever you are on the spectrum, here's the thing. There's something so powerful about the experience that these guys have in the scriptures that their hearts burn within them. Why? Because Jesus explains it to them. And Jesus opens up scriptures. The Bible says, Luke says, that when they're on the road, Jesus opens up. He begins with the prophets and Moses. And then through the whole of scripture, he says, this is my story. This is my narrative. This is how I fit into God's picture. Can you imagine Jesus coming alongside you as you're reading your Bible and say, ah, let me show you. This is where you see me. This is how it all works. And just breathing life and revelation into you. That's what happened with these disciples. And it, it made their hearts burn. And my real strong desire for every single one of us is that we wouldn't just read the Bible, but it would be opened up and our hearts would burn within us. To have that kind of consistent experience where you feel a kind of a fire, a warmth, you, you feel a, a change, a charge, an electricity on the inside of you because Jesus is opening up scripture for you. And it's not just something that you're going through because you have to do it or you're supposed to do it. It's something where suddenly the whole thing comes alive. Now, I, uh, with Kate, we were on a, a retreat. We, we do a little spiritual retreat a couple of times a year where we go away. And uh, sometimes, most of the time on my own uh, or on her own, sometimes we'll combine together, uh, usually split up during the day, come back and eat in the evening. But uh, this time it was Wednesday, just this last week. And I was there with Kate, we'd split up and I'd gone for this walk and I was walking across the coastline in Cornwall, uh, this beautiful, rugged countryside. But inside my heart, I felt a little bit like the guys walking to Emmaus. And I knew that I was going to be speaking on this passage this Sunday. And so it was in my brain. I'm like, yeah, I know what it feels like to have that thing in your heart that said, but I'd hoped, I hoped for so much. I hoped that it would be different to this, but my hopes seemed to not be answered. And just walking with Jesus and saying, I, I know technically you're there somewhere, but I don't feel you right now. I can't hear you right now. I need you to speak to me. And then my phone went. Um, my phone went because it was my birthday. I don't like to make a big deal about it, but it was my birthday. And my mum was ringing me because she's a lovely woman. And uh, she rings me on my birthday. How are you doing, son? And I said, well, actually, mum, I've got these things and I've been praying to God about them, but they've really been affecting me and impacting me. And we begin to talk about stuff. And then she sort of gives the Christian answer. And I hear this Christian answer and she talks about Paul says this and Jesus says this. And I'm like, yeah, mum, 
I know, I know all that stuff. I, I, I know this. This is what I do for a living. I'm a professional. I know this stuff, but I'm not feeling it necessarily right now. And as I talk to her, we approach or I approach this church on the cliffside. And so I talk a little bit more on a bench outside the church. And I say, right, mum, I've got to go. Thank you so much. Um, I'll, I'll ring off now. I'm just going to go and pray inside the church. So I close the call, go into the church. I sit down on a pew, but I want to kneel. There's no kneelers there. And so I look up and I see, ah, oh, there's the altar. And by the altar, there's these kneeling areas. And so I think I'm going to go up to the altar, to the holy place, and I'm going to kneel down and I kneel down. As I kneel down, I just pray and I'm just praying and crying out to God and asking him to help me. And then suddenly I open my eyes and I see my attention is drawn to a room to my left. There's this side chapel in the church and the door is open. The light is on. There's a lectern and there's a book placed out and there's a little sign written above the book. And I thought, what is that? And so I'm curious and I go through the door and I go into the chapel and I look at the sign and it says literally a word from the Lord for you today. It's written, handwritten and put on top of this book and the book is laid open and bits of it are highlighted. And the passage says Wednesday, March the 13th. That was the exact day. That's my birthday. And I read the Bible passage and it is unbelievable. It is as if someone has been eavesdropping on my conversation with my mum and then quickly gone and typed the stuff out, printed it and then put it in the chapel and then hid behind a curtain for me to come in and read it. It was as if someone has literally been listening in on my conversation and listening in on the thoughts of my heart. And it speaks so, so specifically, so powerfully and so I mean, it is literally what my mother has just said to me, but it's all from scripture. And then there's this kind of explanation. And it was just such a weird experience. But what did I feel? I felt my heart burning within me. Would you like to know what it said? Well, that's between me and the Lord. <laughs> but it was so, so powerful. Now, we don't get these experiences all the time, but it shows us that God is always wanting to be with us. And actually, do you know, here's the truth. Listen to this, because for some of you, you just really need to hear this one word. Sometimes God is able to speak most powerfully to us in our times of greatest challenge and difficulty. When we're really going through it, where we are full of doubt, where we're full of hurt and upset and confusion, where we just can't see the wood for the trees. We don't know what is going on and we feel like we're hanging on by a thread. Sometimes it's in those times that Jesus himself, he comes alongside us. We don't necessarily recognize him. And then he speaks into us. And that's what scripture can do for us. Scripture is God's most powerful way of revealing Jesus to us. It's his most normative way of using uh, revelation to show us of his love and to speak into our lives. And that's what happens with these guys. And what we want to get from scripture is not just, well, I'm reading it because it's the passage that I've got to read today, or I'm just having a little bit of a dip in because I feel like I should. What we want is we want to develop such lives of walking with Jesus that we have on a regular basis, that experience of our hearts being warmed within us, our hearts burning. Have you ever had that experience? Have you ever had the experience of suddenly scripture coming alive? Have you ever had the experience of you're looking for God to say something and you go to scripture and then suddenly things are pouring in? It is incredible, but it is the birthright of every follower of Jesus. We deserve this. We are promised it. It's what Jesus wants to give to us. So I want to give you four little principles that I think will help interpret it in your own way. But I think these are four things to keep in mind to be in a position where we can walk with Jesus and he can open scripture up to us. First thing is this, have faith. Everyone say have faith. 
You need to have faith. If you approach reading scripture as, well, it's just one of those things that I'm supposed to do, or it's one of those things that I find difficult to do, uh, you won't get what God wants you to have. But if you have faith that Jesus wants to explain to you, that Jesus wants to come alongside you, that Jesus wants to reveal himself to you, it will make all the difference. So when you read the Bible, just pray and say, Jesus, please help me. Please speak to me. Please open things up to me. Illuminate. I don't want to just go through the motions. I want to make an encounter with you. And then secondly, be systematic. With this, what I mean is sometimes we can be tempted to just kind of dip in, dip out, or to go for a little bit over here and a little bit over there, or just stick to our favorite bits of the Bible. But what's really incredible about what Jesus does is that he starts with the whole of the prophets and Moses, all the Old Testament, and he goes through all of that stuff and bit by bit explains and unveils and reveals himself in these passages. And there's something about having a kind of overview of scripture and going through it in a systematic way that's really, really helpful. But number three, let me kind of qualify that um, with this. It's consistency, not intensity. Now, I've told you that my wife, Kate, she loves to read scripture. She she spends hours and hours uh, reading scripture and listening to stuff and going on podcasts and doing Bonhoeffer and all this jolly jazz. But she loves it. Now, for most of us, that's not necessarily going to be doable. If you hear what I'm saying tonight, watching online or being here in the room and you think, OK, right, got it. Bible open. Heart's burning. I'm going to do it. And you go home and you say, right, I'm going to read the whole of Leviticus tonight. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to go through it all. You might find that you burn out. You flame out after a day or two. I think for many of us, actually, this is controversial. Alan, maybe challenge me on this later. You can, you can all challenge me on this, in fact. I don't necessarily, for me find it that helpful, oh boy, to do the Bible in a, yeah, uh, uh, don't stone me, don't hate me. I've done the Bible in a year many times, over many years since I was a teenager. Um, reading through the Bible, it's great. But what I sometimes find is the stakes are so high that if, and obviously I don't, but if you happen to fall behind by four or five days, which I never do, of course, uh, but if that did happen, it's like a disaster. It's like a nightmare to try and catch up on yourself. What I found is you need to get a routine that you can manage. It's better to be consistent because as I'm consistent with scripture, I begin to kind of make myself more and more open to the voice of Jesus. That's what the Bible does. It reconfigures my, my, my spirit and my mind to be able to hear from God. And so it's better to be consistent. So right now what I'm doing is I'm doing the Bible in two years. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a cheat, but it works for me. Year one, you do half the Old Testament, all of the New Testament, the good stuff. Then year two, you do the other half of the Old Testament and then all of the New Testament again. Hooray. But I've had times in my life when I've done this through a book of the Bible in one year. Like literally you take a book like Ephesians. Ephesians is the one that I've done most recently. And I'm like, this year, and I kind of start at the beginning of the year, this year, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to read Ephesians. And what does that mean? It means I'm going to do one verse or two verses every single day, but I'm really going to sit in them and I'm really going to chew them over. In fact, I'm going to repeat them and meditate on them so much that it becomes uh, part of me, that they're, they're memorized. So with Ephesians, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, when you get into that again and again, that consistency, even though I'm doing just a couple of verses, it really begins to help the Holy Spirit to burn within me and to, to produce something in me. Something that I wouldn't get if I just read through it 
uh, with a, you know, 20 other verses that day and a whole another bit of the Bible. But what it is, the key thing is you find a way to be consistent. If it's a little a day, it's better than trying to do huge chunks and setting yourself tasks that you're only just going to fail at. And then as you kind of get a bit more, I don't know, you, you, you develop a, a hunger for scripture and you want to take more and that's fine. And you can kind of go in those areas, but it's consistency, not intensity. And then finally, most importantly, have faith. Jesus wants to explain to you. The great thing is that he sends his Holy Spirit. He says, it's better for you that I leave because when I leave, I'll leave with you a comforter a coach who will lead you into all truth. Jesus is like the, the spirit of Jesus is like Jesus walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus and saying, this means that this means this, this applies to your life. This is how you take this and, and change as a result of it. And so when I read scripture, I always want to have faith. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe, do you really believe that Jesus wants to reveal himself to you? And do you believe that he wants to do that through scripture? Do you believe that he can do that? And if the answer to that is, yeah, kind of, or I'm not sure, or even if it's just yes, what we need to do is just pray every time we open the Bible. I dare not open scripture without praying first and say, Lord God, open my eyes, open my heart, let me see Jesus, reveal Jesus to me, let me find you in wonderful and unexpected ways. And we will find that even in the midst of suffering and sadness and challenge and disappointment, Jesus coming alongside us and opening our eyes and opening our hearts and revealing himself to us and using the scriptures to pour something so powerful and life-giving into our hearts. So here's the big idea. The risen Jesus walks with us, even in sadness and confusion. We need to create space and invite his spirit to open up the scriptures to us. So our eyes are opened and our hearts are warmed. I'd like us just to close our eyes, take a moment and let's pray. And let's just have a little moment of space. And I want in this space for you to just say, Jesus, this is where I am at. This is what I need from you. For some of you, you have tremendous joy in scripture. It's, it's part of your daily routine. It's part of who you are. It shapes you and molds you. But for others of you, this is a source of just frustration or even guilt. And actually, Jesus doesn't want that for you. Jesus wants to be showing himself to you, breaking bread with you, opening your eyes. He's risen. And his spirit is with us. So just take a moment and say, Jesus, this is what I want from you. This is what I need from you. Will you speak into my situation?